I've got to operate that, so would it be an issue if I sat down? People happy with that? <laughs> okay. Um, as I guess most of you know, I wrote that book quite a few years ago, and then a new edition a couple of years ago. That's the new edition that's come out with a with a postscript and bringing it a bit up to date and fixing up some of the mistakes. And um, when you've written a whole book, there's a lot of things you can talk about. And I thought, I think today I'll structure the talk around the early Chinese community. The book goes right up to the present. And I'm going to be talking through this talk about people who make stuff. I really like people who make things. And I was thinking when we talk about the Chinese, we often talk about the traders, the merchants, the growers, the market gardeners, um, the people who were in service industries, like the laundry people, but not so much about making things. And that's what um, a lot of the debates in Australia have been about, and it's what one of the major debates is about right now today, um, when it looks like we can't perhaps make tins even of um, fruit as competitively as, as can be brought in from overseas. So, um, although I'll be talking about other people through it, there's a lot of um, concentration on actual manufacture of Chinese goods and manufacture in Sydney of goods by Chinese people. So, Europeans have been familiar with goods and artefacts from China from the 16th century. Porcelains, silks, exotic fans, they were all prized in Europe. The British East India Company, which had been importing tea into England, um, had been bringing these things as well since the late 1600s. By the late 1700s, they were not only drinking Chinese tea, but they were drinking it from English-made willow pattern cups, made in English potteries based on a stylized vision of China. And at the time that Governor Philip landed the first convicts at Sydney Cove in 1788, Europeans held thousands of images of China in their minds. Sequined mandarins, buccaneering pirates, Chinese junks, mists over the Pearl River Delta. Very few, very few Europeans had ever seen any of these things, but they knew of them, even if only dimly. As for Sydney, it was a new and entirely unknown place. It wasn't any place, really. It was a nothing place. And to the woman, the convict, who wrote this letter, the idea of tea from China was a comfort to her in a very barbaric and rudimentary place called Sydney Town. <laughs> and indeed, tea from China was coming. The transports, the ships that bought the convicts and supplies to Sydney, needed a return cargo, and the new settlement had absolutely nothing to offer. And so when the ships and the Lady Freen and the Charlotte, the Scarborough, are some of the first fleet, once they'd got rid of their convicts, they sailed for China as soon as they could fit for sea. The East India Company having engaged them to go there for a cargo of tea. So when they arrived in Canton, these ships joined 45 other English ships that sat at anchor in the Pearl River. This huge trading company, the East India Company, was engaged in a triangular trade between Calcutta and Canton and England. And as Sydney joined in on this round route, it too was soon the recipient of goods from China. Everyone wanted what China could provide. Theoretically, the East India Company was not supposed to trade with the convict settlement, but the shippers found a way around this. And the American whaling ships um, that were already in the area from from Nantucket on the east coast of, of um, the United States also found ways of trading from Asia directly into Sydney. If you look at the shipping reports, don't bother but I'll tell you what they say, of the little port of Sydney between 1800 and 1808, 
Almost as many ships arrived in Sydney from Asia and American ports as from Britain, and they were not convict ships. Those originating from Calcutta in India and Nantucket readily included Canton in their route. And so what sorts of things are they bringing? They are some of the oldest things um, from China, retrieved from a shipwreck. Always turn your phone off. <laughs> The ship was wrecked in Bass Strait in February 1797. It had set, out, set sail from Calcutta, headed for Sydney with a cargo of rum, sugar, tobacco, salted meat, Chinese ceramics and tea, barrels of tar, casks of vinegar, footwear, soap, candles, textiles, a musical organ and a horse buggy. And of course most of this was lost at sea, but some of the Chinese ceramics survived and when they were salvaged, People went down, people knew the ship had gone down. They went down um, illegally, most of them, and so salvaged what they could, and this was sold for a high price in Sydney. In the 1990s, a couple of decades ago, a search of the wreck was made, and some of the unbroken plates and crockery were discovered. So these were only discovered in the 1990s. So they're some of the oldest known Chinese ceramics in the country, and they if you want to see them ever, they're in the Victoria Museum of Art um, and Art Gallery in Launceston. China clearly had more to offer than Sydney had to offer. One correspondent for the Sydney Gazette in 1830 remarked that close proximity to China has been a great thing, but he then went on to regret that the idle habit of tea drinking has contributed to a balance of trade decidedly in China's favour. And the, the early newspapers are full of advertisements um, for tea, like that one tea per the giraffe, that's the name of the ship, the Haysom, the orange pico, the gunpowder, the chu chong, and so on, Chinese teas. In the Sydney Gazette of, of at the 15th of January 1833, the Agnes. Um, from Sydney, uh, from China, advertised black tea, green tea, fusion tea, sugar, tobacco, coffee, chocolate, cigars, Lisbon wine, Madeira wine, wax candles, beeswax, ceiling wax, furniture, pictures, marble slabs, slop clothing, hats, caps, beds, chairs, punch bowls, lacquerware, ivoryware, soap, foot pails, toys, chinaware, fireworks, walking sticks, glass beads, seeds, silks, crepes, velvet scores, deer hides, indigo collars, spices, preserves. Plus a whole lot of specific things that individuals in Sydney had ordered. Whatever would we have done without the China trade? It's a question we can ask ourselves today as well. I don't know why there's a lot coming up. I wasn't trying to do anything clever. Um, the latest from China. Curiosities, mother of pearl, tortoise shells, ladies and gentlemen's card cases, fans, wonderful balls, puzzles with books, preserved ginger and, and citron at seven shillings per jar. But notice that they are all on sale at the British and Foreign House at 69 George Street. So this is a European trader a European trading house selling Chinese goods. And many of the goods um, that were made in China were made to European design. And I think that I've, I've tried to categorize the objects um, from China into four categories. The first category, Western designs made in China. That is stuff that was actually ordered for John MacArthur and Elizabeth MacArthur. It was made in Canton, but in the centre of it, there's, a, a, there's a, 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 a moniker, you can't read it, but it says J-E-M-A, John and Elizabeth MacArthur. Oh. It's a completely English, European product made in China. Then the second type of things are works that were commissioned here, but with a Chinese stylistic content. And that's the 
very famous, and I'm sure you've seen that picture before, the Sydney Punch Bowl, which was again produced in Canton, for what we now call Bon Joe. It was made from an engraving uh, made by a Sydney artist, Lewin. The, the engraving is now lost, but it appear, appeared in a book written for William Wentworth. It was published in London in 1820. It's not quite European, though. The peony roses around the top are Chinese. And it's also a Chinese object, because drinking punch, which became very common in, in the colonies and in Europe, was based on the China trade using spices that came from the east, if not from China, from Southeast Asia, from the Spice Islands, on those ships from Canton. Um, if you want to see that bowl, if that one is held in the State Library of New South Wales, it's actually easier to see a companion bowl. There's one other one which is the same or similar, um, which is in the National Maritime Museum at Darwin Harbour. Go and see it. It's a fantastic Chinese object. There's another punch bowl. That one's entirely Chinese. So my third category are everyday Chinese products made in China with Chinese design used by ordinary people in, for everyday things. Both of those objects were about 1815. Both were found in an archaeological dig in the rocks in Sydney, in George Cribb's well, to be specific. If they'd been thrown out with the rubbish by a convict who had made it to the status of a butcher in the rocks. The second one, this one of course, is a famous Chinese motives which inspired many English potteries to manufacture willow pattern china, but that one is Chinese. It predates um, Wedgwood and, and all of the English um, designs. Then there are objects that don't fall into the cheap essential category, but beautiful objects, presumably purchased for their intrinsic appeal by people who collected them. This, I can't tell you. <laughs> this would have included some of the shawls and the bands, the ivory, the lacquer, described in those import lists. And things like that coin box and that teapot, both found here. Both Chinese aesthetic um, manufactured about the 1830s. Even an ornament like that, Fa Lin is a very popular um, deity in China, originated long ago, I'm told, from India, started off as Hindu, became um, um, Buddhist, and is, is still a popular um, <laughs> goddess throughout China today always made in white porcelain. This is a battered fragment of her. The head is missing. Um, I saw her, and I took that photo the other day under a car park in Darling Harbour where the Sydney Cove Authority keeps all the things that they've dug up from the rocks. It is thought, somebody at the art gallery thought that it is possibly 14th century. And if that's the case, it's very old indeed. It was found at Lily Vale, which was one of the more substantial houses in the rocks. How did it get there? A serious collector of antiques, perhaps, bought it? A sailor who bought it in a Chinese bazaar and gave it to his mum? We don't know. But here it is, located in the detritus of the rocks household, thrown out with the rubbish. So, Chinese things were clearly ubiquitous, including British-made things to look Chinese. But what about Chinese people? There were a few here and there. And if the book that talks about some of the earliest Chinese um, people that were in Sydney from the beginning. And by about 1861, there were 13,000 Chinese in New South Wales coming for the gold, but fewer than 200 in Sydney. But all of those people who were coming for gold were passing through on their way to the diggings. And hence, those who were in Sydney were, uh, were establishing trading shores, stores, and boarding houses, primarily at first in the rocks. They say if there's a gold rush on, you make sure you're the bloke who sells the picks and shovels, <laughs> and the rice, and the baskets, and all of the things that Chinese um, hopeful diggers wanted to take with them. So by um, 1861, there are Chinese names in the Sydney directories, business directories. 
your SANS directories, which are like a precursor of a telephone book to tell you who's where. In Cambridge Street in the rocks, there were several dealers. There were several boarding houses in Gloucester Street. But in Cumberland Street, there was a cabinet maker, Ark John Wong, and this is significant. There is somebody manufacturing in the rocks. On the High Street itself, and George Street um, at that stage was very much Sydney's High Street, there were shop fronts, this is 1861, of at least four traders, shopkeepers who were recorded as Chong Jin and three listed merchants, Upper Lu Henry, Chin Atik, who is sometimes recorded as Chen Atik, and Nom Hing and Co. This, this firm was a Hong Kong firm. It was located near the quay, um, I guess somewhere near where um, the park begins if you go past the Carl Expressway and you're heading down to the Museum of Contemporary Art. On that side of George Street um, was that building. No longer were Chinese goods simply being imported by Europeans, but they were being imported by Chinese merchants as well. Now, two years on um, from, and that's already gone by the 1880s, so that, that's well and truly there in the 1860s. Two years on in 1863, there are nine Chinese stores and boarding houses and bookshops and one cabinet maker on the street. And by 1870, there were five furniture makers in George Street North, George Street of the Rocks. So there's a rapid establishment of a Chinese presence. And this must be understood to be in a part of town that was not unprosperous. Later on, the rocks became a slum. But the slums in these decades, although they carried a whiff of the seaport about them, they, they shouldn't imagine that they were the run-down precinct that they later became. Neither was it a Chinatown. The Chinese presence is real and visible and physically integrated amongst other commercial and residential places. If the Chinese people who ran these places were not fully integrated into mainstream society, nor were they anything like being an excluded group, this was not a ghetto or an enclave, but it was part of how everyone did trade in Sydney. And I don't know if you can see the details of that at the back. Um, this is up the road on, on George Street from our, our building we've just seen at Yi Sang Lu. Yi Sang Lu is just a little bit down there towards the window. So we're on the eastern side of George Street coming up um, south. We have Lee, the confectioner. Good, you can see it better than me. <laughs> we have Sung Ki, a tobacconist, next door him. We have a huge Chinese timber yard and cabinet factory making things. And next to that, we have Ah Toy. No, he's further along, but that's his that's his his um, his uh, yard. But Ah Toy is down towards the next corner cabinet maker next to the volunteer hotel um, at the corner. I'm going to make that end bit there bigger because I'm going to talk about our toy a bit. There he is, our toy cabinet maker. His, his yards are further back. Um, and there is his shop, our toy, at 192 next to the hotel. I don't know what happened to our toy shop. In fact, the hotel collapsed one day in a storm, but that's another story. <laughs> so he's got large workshops. The, book, the building is two-storey. It's respectable. And I want you to remember that guy because we will get back to him. So that's where we've come from. We're going along George Street. Let's go further along the eastern side of George Street further south. We have Wa Hap, the cabinet maker, Wei Ki, importer, Gi Yik, importer, Gi Yong, fruiterer, up here. Clearly, 
we've got a strong Chinese presence in, in the rocks. Let's cross the road, so we'll go to the other side of George Street. Um, no, maybe we're, maybe we're not going to do that. That's it, isn't it? Cross yeah, the road. This is the locality of some of the major Chinese merchants and trading companies. Kung Yu Long, Su Hing Long, Sun Yong Ti, all merchants, then Tuk Chong and Sam Choi, occupations not specified, then Kei Ki, who I think is Wei Ki, who we've already met on the other side, so it's got several <coughs> shops, Sun Wu Lung across the corner. But have a look behind. Have a look behind up Little Essex Street. Both sides, cabinet makers, workshops, a war hop, hat, and cabinet makers on this side as well. And if we went into, we could talk about this particular map for a long, long time, and a lot of the houses at the back um, are also occupied by Chinese people who are living in them. But I'm just looking at the actual preferred companies at the moment, businesses. We know about many of these people from the records, especially from a Royal Commission that was held in 1891 into so-called Chinese gambling. That's what the Royal Commission was about. And surprise, surprise, the findings of it were the, was the main finding of it that I could work out was that um, the New South Wales police were fairly corrupt. And that's not the problem. <laughs> but because we have this Royal Commission, Dozens and dozens of all these people that are, or all these successors who were in these shops in 1891 are being interviewed in relation to gambling and opium, the things that the Europeans tended to go apoplectic about. But they're also being questioned about the record of many everyday things. So we know about their connections to trade, to retailing, to running boarding houses, to cook shops, acting as interpreters in the court, in court cases undertaking community work to support their fellow countrymen, remitting money and letters back to China, sending